Northern New England is full of thousands of miles of trails that lead you mostly from point A to point B. But now and then, if you happen to get off the trail, you may just discover an unexpected treasure. That's what we're going to do today. So stick around. Welcome to Windows to the Wild. I'm Willem Lang. Last summer, we were filming uh, some students who were canoeing on the Connecticut River. Basically. And I met a man named Jason Berard, who was there to teach him some outdoor skills. He was from the Upper Valley Land Trust. And a few months later, I got a note from Jason telling me about some of the uh, mysterious and odd places he's come across while hiking. Well, naturally, I was curious, and I still am. So, here's Jason. <laughs> Hi, Will. Hi. Uh, these really are mysterious places? Uh, yeah. You, um, you know, my favorite thing to do out uh, in the woods is just wander. And yeah. uh, if you do that long enough, you see some pretty strange things. I should think. Where are we today? Uh, today we are at Smith Pond Shaker Forest, which is one of the Upper Valley Land Trust's uh, yeah, uh, right. 20 conservation areas. And we'll be seeing, um, let's see, we'll be seeing the remnants of the Shaker Waterworks system, uh, a couple of reservoirs and a canal, maybe some chestnut trees. And, ah, chestnut uh, trees. And a Da Vinci Bridge. The Da Vinci Bridge, okay, <laughs> I'm looking forward to that. Okay, so uh, I can't think of any reason not to get going. Can yeah. You? It's going to get hot later. It sure is. It's getting hot already. Oh, yeah. Okay. Vamanos. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go. Are bikes allowed here? Um, you know, the trails aren't particularly optimized for mountain bikes. Yeah. Um, but they, mountain bikers do come out here from time to time. It took me a couple tries to find the trailhead parking lot. But I found it. Drive about a mile east of the Shaker Museum on Route 4A in Enfield, and you'll come upon a sign for Smith Pond Shaker Forest. That's where we begin our hike. We're on Smith Pond Loop Trail, a 7.3 mile and fairly easy hike. Jason's taking us to a place where Shaker history sits hidden. I guess you're not going to replace that. But we're visiting more than the past. It's a story about engineering, sweat, and sheer determination. The Shakers founded the Enfield community in 1793. It became home to three families where brothers, sisters, and children lived, worked, and worshiped together. They believed in equality of the sexes and races. They practiced celibacy and pacifism. That way of life continued in Enfield until 1923, when declining membership forced the Shakers to close the community and sell the property to an order of Catholic priests. There's a third member of our party hiking with us today, besides Kiki, but far more important, Alan Strickland. You're a volunteer here? Or what? I do. I, I help the uh, uh, Upper Valley Land Trust. Great, great. So you wander around here a lot? Aimlessly. <laughs> <laughs> Aimlessly and endlessly. Yeah. That's great. Well, pleasure to have you with us. Yeah. And Thank I'm, you. And you know, we may need you to help carry the old man out. You All never right. know. So hang on. <laughs> Nine of them. <laughs> if you look alongside the path, you'll see what remains of a canal etched in the forest floor. The Shakers dug it by hand to move water from uphill to their community downhill. Water powered their mills and grew their food. 
Yeah, we're not too sure of the timing of the different components of the water yep. system because yep. the records for the shakers for this community burned in the fire. Um, but my guess is this was probably one of the earlier reservoirs. Yep. And they probably worked their way up the hill, adding more reservoirs and more canals as, as they needed more water. The canals lead us to what was about 180 years ago, a reservoir. We step off the path and down over a bank. Look up and there sit the remains of a stone dam. It was blown out years ago by a storm. A spillway survived as if to remind us that the people who built it knew what they were doing. Look at that. Well, this stone is four feet across. It's gotta be, who knows how long it is on this end. Yeah. Wow. And there's just one after the other that forms the ceiling of this spillway. And uh, it's just amazing. And where they got the rocks. You know, yeah. I mean, they must have a tall foot long slab, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's a shame that the records burned. It would be so yeah. nice yeah. to know the sequence of how. And they knew what they, they were doing with the spillway business they, uh, to save the dam. This is just an amazing feat of not only uh, muscle and bone and human nature, and grit, but of engineering too. They uh, built a stone spillway here that would take the pressure off the dam. Unfortunately, at one point it must have been overwhelmed, but geez, what a job to build this dam. Beautiful. This property is, uh, it's a really unique combination of uh, unusual natural resources and cultural resources. And really both of those things would have been at risk if this property were developed. I mean, it's a thousand acres. Uh, you could probably put an awful lot of house lots on a thousand <laughs> acres given whatever the yeah. zoning is in Enfield. So. There's the traffic going down through <laughs> Mascoma. Oh God. So the canals, uh, all of the Shaker history could have been lost. Yeah. Uh, the chestnut trees could have been lost. Um, uh -huh. And it would have placed, placed a significant burden, I imagine, on the infrastructure in Enfield yeah. if this were all developed. So, so you saved it. And, uh, yeah. Now, how much, how much interest is there in the Shaker history? Do people ask about that a lot or what? They do. It's a really interesting aspect of this property. Yeah. Uh, the Shaker Museum down the road uh, ah, yeah. runs okay. trips up here when they're doing it. They talk about this at all? Yeah. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Great. It was wet that first year. Not everything that Jason and Alan want to show us is off the trail. It's like, a, yeah, there's three or four arch spans and then the deck. The Da Vinci uh, Bridge is part of the trail. It crosses over arch Shaker spans, Brook. The, they're sort of H's and they support self support. So. Oh, I see what you got. You got like a, a queen post. Underneath. It's like, a, yeah, there's three or four arch spans and then the deck is yeah. run over the top of that. Yeah. And the arch spans, the, they're sort of H's and they support itself support. So huh. we did add hardware to it, but you don't need to. Folks from the Upper Valley Land Trust manage all of this property. In fact, they built the bridge with help from volunteers. Lovely. Kind of a big bridge for a little brook, but it was an awful lot of fun to make, and it does keep the brook up, uh, the bridge up out yeah. of the brook bed. Yeah. Makes it a little more flood resistant. That's a Da Vinci, huh? Mm -hmm. 
As we prepare to move on, a trail runner and her dog show us that the bridge is as useful as it is interesting. Come on, good boy. Yeah. All right, you guys are looking great. Oh, wow, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Come on, Have a good run. <laughs> Well, we've followed the canal now up to the Da Vinci Bridge, and I can only imagine what's next. <laughs> so the whole trail system here, we could keep going and end up at the pond this way, but I think for today we'll, we'll drive around to the other trailhead on Smith Pond Road and we'll head into the pond from there. Okay, good. There's a canoes over there somewhere. There's, we've got some canoes stashed. We'll try and get out on the water. Okay, okay. Maybe we'll go for a swim even, who knows? God, I hope not. <laughs> okay, let's go. We're heading to Smith Pond. It's the source of water that once fed the canals, the reservoir, and life at the Shaker community. back to the trailhead parking lot, Jason stops us. He asks if we notice anything unusual off the trail. Well, it takes a few minutes, but there it is, wedged between a limb and a tree trunk, 20 feet off the ground. <laughs> I mean, that in that instance, um... In that instance, I just had a chuckle and thought, gosh, you know, some, some guy threw that up in a tree thinking he was gonna, you know, yes. shoot his deer there that winter and, and then, you know, it's still there. Who knows how long, I mean, that, that chair is now folded up so that it's, it's hard to imagine anyone ever being able to actually have sat in that chair. Last fall, we did a scavenger hunt out here. <laughs> and one of the things people were supposed to try and find was a, was a tree in a chair. Um, nobody found it. Nobody found nobody it. Nobody found it. Well, you gotta know where to look, you know. I think I spent a lot of my time in the woods just gazing, staring, yeah. staring up yeah. instead of going. I've been by here hundreds, hundreds of times and I've, I've never seen it. <laughs> now you'll never I've miss never it. I've never seen it. Now, you'll, now yeah. you'll never miss it, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. So this cellar hole is about a mile away from Tunis Road, and it's about a half a mile away from Wolfboro Road. And there are no other roads around here. So I'm struggling a little bit to imagine, you know, how long ago it must have been that someone lived here and, and what, how they got up here. <laughs> These discoveries are the reasons Jason likes to step off the trail. He knows the treasures await those who dare to wander. I think if you spend enough time outside wandering around, you're going to come across some weird stuff. Um, some of the weird things that I've come across are um, this funky quartzite mine here on Smith Pond that has, it's shaped like a skull. Up on Moose Mountain in Hanover, there's a just random wood stove sitting in the middle of the woods, high up on the mountain, not on, near any trail, not near any cabin. It's just there. Hey all, Jason Berard, stewardship director here at Upper Valley Land Trust, out monitoring a conservation easement along the Connecticut River. And uh, I came across this really funky box culvert. Off we go. Yep, feet are soaked. Man, look at the stones. They're huge in the ceiling. Ooh, very funky. It's got all this stonework along the edge of the canal. All right, anyway, that's me signing off from Upper Valley Land Trust. Thanks, take care. Sometimes I, I study some of the backstory beforehand and go try and find these places, and sometimes I, my absolute favorite thing to do is just wander without a plan for the day. And if I come across something, then sort of do the research afterwards to try and figure out what the heck was going on there. Mm -hmm. 
Smith Pond awaits our arrival. I'm sure they must have cut the church in. And so is its only human resident. Greg Baker is an orthodontist. He lives and works in Hanover, New Hampshire. But this is where Greg loves to be. He's the only private landowner on the thousand acre conservation area. My cabin is around the corner and um, so I've spent uh, the last 18 years uh, living in that cabin. This is how Greg gets around the pond. He discovered this place by chance. In the early 2000s, I've was taking a commuter flight into the Lebanon airport and I, I flew over the area and I said, boy, look at that place, there's no houses at all. So I, the next week I got the tax maps to see who owned land here. And everybody wants a place on water, obviously, but so I, I looked and I found that Fish and Game owns 5,000, four or 5,000 acres here. There was another parcel of 50 acres and another parcel the, uh, had 12,000 acres. And so I called the guy from Texas who owned that, and I asked him if he wanted to sell it, and he said no. And then I called the lady with the 50 acres, and, and she'd had it in her family for like um, probably 50 or 60 years. I called her and asked her, I made her an offer, and she laughed at me. <laughs> so. So then I, I, I countered the offer. I said, all right, I'll give you, I'll give you 95,000 and free dental work the rest of your life. And she did laugh a little bit after that. And I said, call me if you're interested. And it was funny, two weeks later, she called me was, and, and she, she basically called me and said, okay, 95. And I never met her, so obviously I didn't do any dental work on her. At one end of the pond, a dam holds back about 63 acres of water. That's an area of 63 football fields. It was built by the Shakers to feed their water system. But that was a long time ago. This water went out the, uh, the stream and, and went to where we were this morning through the canal and they used it for, the, for their power, their, their mills. Yeah, the canal fed the mill pond yeah. down at the, uh, yeah. at the mill, yeah. at the Shaker Village. Yeah. Clever guys. A lot of work. A lot of work to turn a mill. <laughs> they, they couldn't just, a lot, couldn't a lot just of work start. to dig a canal. Yeah. Okay. It's right. a long one and full of rocks. It must, be a, it must be at least two miles. Really? That long? Huh? Down, yeah, back to the, Whoa. where they? Well, there's two of them. <laughs> They're all gone now. No left. Oh well. Yeah. This is a beautiful spot. I'm glad Greg saved it, you know. The next surprise was that I realized when the water disappeared in that next summer that there was a problem with the dam here. And so then I dug a little deeper into, you know, the the, the dam and what the and I found out it was condemned in 1971. So I began to wonder if that was the best investment of $95,000 or not, because the water was pretty much 50% gone in the summer here. So, and it was leaking under this dam, about 200 gallons a minute. The state's attorney general ordered the dam removed. Greg and a partner said no. They wanted to preserve the pond and had a plan. So I talked to my partner from Texas, and so we started the process of, of, uh, of re-engineering re and rebuilding it. So, and, uh, and we met, we met the, the uh, historic people, the historic preservations, the, anything that was related to the Shakers, like the back stone we had to keep. The first dike over there, we had to, we couldn't disrupt those stones. So there was, and then there was the, the, the loon people, the, the wildlife or the water, resources and there's all these so you saw my permit board there's like 15 permits army corps of engineer so that process took five years and about nine hundred thousand dollars to replace the dam 
habitat at Smith Pond was saved. So too was the dam's history. Greg eventually put his property into easement. The Upper Valley Land Trust manages it. Without Greg and Paul Kavicki investing the money in re repairing those dams, it would not have been possible for any conservation entity to take ownership of that property. Uh, the liability of the, of the um, condemned dam would have just been too great for, for anybody to, any nonprofit to handle. There's nothing like this place. You know, you, 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 don't see, you don't see places like this that don't have, you know, cabins all around it. So my goal was to, to preserve it. Because I like outdoor spaces better than I do indoor spaces, basically. When he was in our office signing the conservation easement, he wept. Um, it meant so much to him. He'd probably be really mortified if I told you that. Um, but that he cares so much about this place. Um, and I mean, it's obvious in how he, you know, everything he said today to you guys, but um, it's really nice to have a neighbor that cares as much about this place as we do. Yeah. After paddling around islands and into small bays, Jason and Greg take us to a place where a treasure rests underwater. This sunken relic, we're not quite sure what it is. Um, Nobody ever dipped, dove, dipped, dived on it? A uh, retired National Park Service diver um, did come and dive here and did an archaeological study of the vessel. The weird thing is, part of it has plywood, plywood, has plywood but... which you would think, I would have thought that that would have meant that it was at least from the 20th century, but apparently plywood has been made since like the 1840s or something. But it, it, the front of it's turned up like a sled, huh. and it has runners on the bottom. Oh, well, so, so okay. I think it would be pushed across the ice. Yeah. It looks like whatever it was used for, that it was intentionally scuttled. Um, it's got rocks weighting it down and a hole in the, in, the bait, in the bottom of it. What we have now is a beautiful conservation area managed by the Upper Valley Land Trust. It's open to the public, and Greg thinks that's a good thing. You can have a stressful day at work, but when you go through that gate down there, the stress just tapers off as you get up here. The natural world is, is it makes people heal, I think. I think that, uh, you know, creating, you know, large tracts of land that are conserved like this, as well as, you know, small park, pocket parks in urban areas, you know, keeping, keeping communities connected to the world, the natural world around them, it's just so important. You know, like Greg said, it's what, it, what keeps you centered. It, it's, it's what keeps you calm. For young kids, it's what helps them acquire uh, what teachers call executive function skills um, that help them sort of regulate their emotions and their decision making. Um, it's just, it's just, it's important to creating a healthy community. And I think it's a way that we can help give voice to the natural world. The Upper Valley Land Trust manages more than 200 easements. They're all open for public use. If you visit, Jason suggests you take time to seek 
those hidden treasures. People are welcome to wander wherever they want. Maybe they'll find another weird thing in the wood that they can tell me where it is. Well, we're ending our day, and a warm one it was, here at Greg's camp on Smith Pond. It's a beautiful place. It's been a beautiful day, and I want to thank all these great guys behind me for making it possible. I'm Willem Lang, and I hope to see you again on Windows to the Wild. Support for the production of Windows to the Wild is provided by the Alice J. Reen Charitable Trust, the Fuller Foundation, the Gilbert Verney Foundation, and viewers like you. Thank you.